vi Lenin. On the so-called market question. 6. Let us now draw the conclusions which follow from the above table. The first conclusion is that the concept, market, is quite inseparable from the concept of the social division of labor, the general basis of all commodity and consequently, let us add, of capitalist, production as Marx calls it. The market arises where, and to the extent that, social division of labor and commodity production appear. The dimensions of the market are inseparably connected with the degree of specialization of social labor. It, a commodity, cannot acquire the properties of a socially recognized universal equivalent, except by being converted into money. That money, however, is in someone else's pocket. In order to entice the money out of that pocket, our friend's commodity must, above all things, be a use value to the owner of the money. For this, it is necessary that the labor expended upon it be of a kind that is socially useful, of a kind that constitutes a branch of the social division of labor. But division of labor is a system of production which has grown up spontaneously and continues to grow behind the backs of the producers. The commodity to be exchanged may possibly be the product of some new kind of labor that pretends to satisfy newly arisen requirements, or even to give rise itself to new requirements. A particular operation, though yesterday, perhaps, forming one out of the many operations conducted by one producer in creating a given commodity, may today separate itself from this connection may establish itself as an independent branch of labor and send its incomplete product to market as an independent commodity, des capital, book 1, page 85, footnote 4, my italics. Thus, the limits of the development of the market, in capitalist society, are set by the limits of the specialization of social labor. But this specialization, by its very nature is as infinite as technical developments. To increase the productivity of human labor in, for instance, the making of some part of a whole product, the production of that part must be specialized, must become a special one concerned with mass production and, therefore, permitting, and engendering, the employment of machines, etc. that is on the one hand. On the other hand, technical progress in capitalist society consists in the socialization of labor, and this socialization necessarily calls for specialization in the various functions of the production process, for their transformation from scattered, isolated functions repeated separately in every establishment engaged in this production, into socialized functions concentrated in one, new establishment, and calculated to satisfy the requirements of the whole of society. I shall quote an example. Recently, in the United States, the woodworking factories are becoming more and more specialized, new factories are springing up exclusively for the making of, for instance, axe handles, broom handles, or extensible tables. Machine building is making constant progress, new machines are being continuously invented to simplify and cheapen some sign of production. Every branch of furniture making, for instance, has become a trade requiring special machines and special workers. In carriage building, wheel rims are made in special factories, Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, wheel spokes are made in Indiana and Ohio, and hubs again are made in special factories in Kentucky and Illinois. All these separate parts are bought by factories which specialize in the making of whole wheels. Thus, quite a dozen factories take part in the building of some cheap kind of vehicle, Mr. Tverskoy, 10 years in America, Vesna Kiev Rapi. 1893, 1. I quote from Nick on, footnote 5, page 91, footnote 1. This shows how wrong is the assertion that the growth of the market in capitalist society caused by the specialization of social labor must cease as soon as all natural producers become commodity producers. Russian carriage building has long become commodity production, but wheel rims, say, are still made in every carriage builders, or wheelwrights shop, the technical level is low, production is split up among a mass of producers. Technical progress must entail the specialization of different parts of production, their socialization, and, consequently, the expansion of the market. Here the following reservation must be made. 
All that has been said by no means implies the rejection of the proposition that a capitalist nation cannot exist without foreign markets. Under capitalist production, an equilibrium between production and consumption is achieved only by a series of fluctuations, the larger the scale of production, and the wider the circle of consumers it is calculated to serve, the more violent are the fluctuations. It can be understood, therefore, that when bourgeois production has reached a high degree of development it can no longer keep within the limits of the national state, competition compels the capitalists to keep on expanding production and to seek foreign markets for the mass sale of their products. Obviously, the fact that a capitalist nation must have foreign markets just as little violates the law that the market is a simple expression of the social division of labor under commodity economy and, consequently, that it can grow as infinitely as the division of labor, as crises violate the law of value. Lamentations about markets appeared in Russian literature only when certain branches of our capitalist production, for example, the cotton industry, had reached full development, embraced nearly the entire home market and become concentrated in a few huge enterprises. The best proof that the material basis of the idle talk and questions of markets is precisely the interests of our large-scale capitalist industry, is the fact that nobody in our literature has yet prophesied the ruin of our handicrafts industry because of the disappearance of markets, although the handicrafts industry produces values totaling over a thousand million rubles and supplies the very same impoverished people. The wailing about the ruin of our industry due to the shortage of markets is nothing more than a thinly disguised maneuver of our capitalists, who in this way exert pressure on policy, identify, in humble avowal of their own impotence, the interests of their pockets with the interests of the country and are capable of making the government pursue a policy of colonial conquest, and even of involving it in war for the sake of protecting such state interests. The bottomless pit of Narodnik utopianism and Narodnik simplicity is needed for the acceptance of this wailing about markets, these crocodile tears of a quite firmly established and already conceited bourgeoisie, as proof of the impotence of Russian capitalism. The second conclusion is that the impoverishment of the masses of the people, that indispensable point in all the Narodnik arguments about the market, not only does not hinder the development of capitalism, but, on the contrary, is the expression of that development, is a condition of capitalism and strengthens it. Capitalism needs the free laborer, and impoverishment consists in the petty producers being converted into wage workers. The impoverishment of the masses is accompanied by the enrichment of a few exploiters. The ruin and decline of small establishments is accompanied by the strengthening and development of bigger ones, both processes facilitate the growth of the market. The impoverished peasant who formerly lived by his own farming now lives by earnings, that is, by the sale of his labor power, he now has to purchase essential articles of consumption, although in a smaller quantity and of inferior quality. On the other hand, the means of production from which this peasant is freed are concentrated in the hands of a minority, are converted into capital, and the product now appears on the market. This is the only explanation of the fact that the mass expropriation of our peasantry in the post-reform epoch has been accompanied by an increase and not a decrease in the gross productivity of the country footnote 1, and by the growth of the home market, it is a known fact that there has been an enormous increase in the output of the big factories and works and that there has been a considerable extension of the handicraft industries, both work mainly for the home market and there has been a similar increase in the amount of grain circulating in the home markets, the development of the grain trade within the country. The third conclusion, about the significance of the production of means of production, calls for a correction to the table. As has already been stated, that table does not at all claim to depict the whole process of development of capitalism, but only to show how the replacement of natural by commodity economy and of the latter by capitalist economy affects the market. That is why accumulation was disregarded in the table. Actually, however, capitalist society cannot exist without accumulating, for competition compels every capitalist on pain of ruin to expand production. Such expansion of production is depicted in the table, producer 1, for example in the interval between the third and fourth periods, expanded his output of C threefold, from 2E to 6C, formerly he worked alone in his workshop, 
now he has two wage workers. Obviously, that expansion of production could not have taken place without accumulation. He had to build a special workshop for several persons, to acquire implements of production on a larger scale, and to purchase larger quantities of raw materials and much else. The same applies to producer 4, who expanded the production of B. This expansion of individual establishments, the concentration of production, must of necessity have entailed, or increased, it makes no difference, the production of means of production for the capitalists, machines, iron, coal, etc. The concentration of production increased the productivity of labor, replaced hand by machine labor and discarded a certain number of workers. On the other hand, there was a development in the production of these machines and other means of production, converted by the capitalist into constant capital which now begins to grow more rapidly than variable capital. If, for example, we compare the fourth period with the sixth, we shall find that the production of means of production has increased 50%, because in the former case there are two capitalist enterprises requiring an increase of constant capital, and in the latter, three. By comparing this increase with the growth in the production of articles of consumption we arrive at the more rapid growth of the production of means of production mentioned above. The whole meaning and significance of this law of the more rapid growth of means of production lies in the one fact that the replacement of hand by machine labor, in general the technical progress that accompanies machine industry, calls for the intense development of the production of coal and iron, those real means of production as means of production. It is clearly evident from the following statement that the author failed to understand the meaning of this law, and allowed the schemes depicting the process to screen its real nature from him, viewed from the side this production of means of production as means of production seems absolutely absurd, but the accumulation of money for money's sake by Plyushkin footnote 6, was also an absolutely absurd process. Both know not what they do. That is precisely what the Narodniks try their utmost to prove, the absurdity of Russian capitalism, which, they aver, is ruining the people, but is not providing a higher organization of production. Of course, that is a fairy tale. There is nothing absurd in replacing hand by machine labor, on the contrary, the progressive work of human technique consists precisely in this. The higher the level of technical development the more is human hand labor ousted being replaced by machines of increasing complexity, and ever larger places taken in the country's total production by machines and the articles needed for their manufacture. Footnote 2. These three conclusions must be supplemented by two further remarks. Firstly, what has been said does not negate the contradiction in the capitalist mode of production which Marx spoke of in the following words, the laborers as buyers of commodities are important for the market but as sellers of their own commodity, labor power, capitalist society tends to keep them down to the minimum price, des capital, bd. 2, s. 303, number 32 footnote 7, it, has been shown above that in capitalist society that part of social production which produces articles of consumption must also grow. The development of the production of means of production merely sets the above-mentioned contradiction aside but does not abolish it. It can only be eliminated with the elimination of the capitalist mode of production itself. It goes without saying, however, that it is utterly absurd to regard that contradiction as an obstacle to the full development of capitalism in Russia, as the Narodniks are fond of doing, incidentally, that is sufficiently explained by the table. Secondly, when discussing the relation between the growth of capitalism and of the market, we must not lose sight of the indubitable fact that the development of capitalism inevitably entails a rising level of requirements for the entire population, including the industrial proletariat. This rise is created in general by the increasing frequency of exchange of products, which results in more frequent contacts between the inhabitants of town and country, of different geographical localities, and so forth. It is also brought about by the crowding together, the concentration of the industrial proletariat, which enhances their class consciousness and sense of human dignity and enables them to wage a successful struggle against the predatory tendencies of the capitalist system. This law of increasing requirements has manifested itself with full force in the history of Europe, 
compare, for example, the French proletariat of the end of the 18th and of the end of the 19th centuries, or the British worker of the 1840s footnote 3, and of today. This same law operates in Russia, too. The rapid development of commodity economy and capitalism in the post-reform epoch has caused a rise in the level of requirements of the peasantry, too. The peasants have begun to live a cleaner life, as regards clothing, housing, and so forth. That this undoubtedly progressive phenomenon must be placed to the credit of Russian capitalism and of nothing else is proved if only by the generally known fact, noted by all the investigators of our village handicrafts and of peasant economy in general, that the peasants of the industrial localities live a far cleaner life than the peasants engaged exclusively in agriculture and hardly touched by capitalism. Of course, that phenomenon is manifested primarily and most readily in the adoption of the purely outward, ostentatious aspect of civilization, but only errant reactionaries like Mr. V. V. are capable of bewailing it and seeing nothing in it but decline. Notes 1. This may be a debatable point only in relation to the agricultural industry. Grain production is in a state of absolute stagnation, says Mr. N. On, for example. He bases his conclusion on the data for only eight years, 1871 to 1878. Let us examine the data for an longer period, an eight-year period is, of course, too short. Let us compare the statistics for the 1860s, Military Statistical Abstract, 1871, the 1870s, N, ON's data and the 1880s, returns for Russia, 1890. The data cover 50 gubernias of European Russia and all crops, including potatoes. 2. Naturally, therefore, it is wrong to divide the development or capitalism into development in breadth and in depth, the entire development proceeds on account of division of labor, there is no essential difference between the two features. Actually, however, the difference between them boils down to different stages of technical progress. In the lower stages of the development of capitalist technique, simple cooperation and manufacture, the production or means of production as means of production does not yet exist, it emerges and attains enormous development only at the higher stage, large-scale machine industry. 3. C.F. Frederick Engels the condition of the working class in England in 1844. That was a state of most horrible and sordid poverty, in the literal sense of the word, and of utter loss of the sense of human dignity. 4. C.K. Marx, Capital, Volume 1, Moscow, 1959 page 106. 5. Nikon or Enon was the pseudonym of N.F. Danielson, one of the ideologists of liberal narrativism of the 1880s and 1890s. The book by Nikolai, on quoted here is called Sketches on our Post-Reform Social Economy, St. Petersburg, 1893. 6. Plyushkin, a character in N. V. Gogol's Dead Souls. The name Plyushkin, a tight-fisted landlord, has come to typify extreme avarice. 7. C. K. Marx, Capital, Volume 2. Moscow, 1957, page 316, footnote 32. End of chapter 6